Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Kraus Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by former Syracuse basketball player Demetrius Nichols. I talked with Demetrius about what he learned in his year as a Syracuse graduate assistant, his new gig as an assistant coach with the Toronto Raptors G League team, and his inspirational story of how he overcame a childhood stutter. Well, welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, to today's podcast because uh, we're joined by one of my favorite Syracuse players of all time, uh, Demetrius Nichols. Demetrius, welcome to the podcast. And how are you doing? Uh, Mike, um, I'm honored to be on your podcast. Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. I just had a game last night. And I was able to come home for a couple of hours. So I'm actually home, dropped my daughters off at school, and I'm going to be out in the morning. So, but so far, so good. Everything is good. Well, that's a great thing that you're able to make it back to the Syracuse area every once in a while. Because, you know, when you say you had a game last night, we're recording the day after Syracuse just played. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, they just played Oakland at the Dome last night. But that's not the game you had. You're now with the with the Raptors 905, the Toronto Raptors G League affiliate, and mm-hmm. uh, you guys had a game. Uh, tell me, how has it been um, moving from the college ranks to the professional ranks and, and coaching with the Raptors 905? Well, it's a big difference. Uh, you know, you're dealing with you know older guys, you know guys who guys who have been in the NBA, guys who are trying to get to the NBA guys who played overseas who want to give themselves another opportunity to get seen by NBA scouts and GMs of that nature. Um, you know, practice wise, you know, we have 50 games versus 30 games in the regular season uh, versus college. So it's definitely different. And also I'm an assistant coach. Uh, last year I was a grad assistant. So I was helping out the assistants last year. Now, um, I have people helping me out as an, uh, you know, as an assistant coach um, under our head coach, Eric Crowley. Um, so it's a, been a great opportunity, great journey, learning a lot. I've definitely became a better coach in these past couple of months, uh, definitely matured in a lot of different ways. Obviously, I took some steps, but I have a lot of things to still learn. But so far, so good. Well, let's back up to last year when you were a grad assistant at Syracuse. Uh, you know, you, you re- returned to your alma mater to get into coaching. Yes. What was that season like for you uh, under Coach Bayheim and working with guys like Jerry McNamara, Alan Griffin, and Adrian Autry? Well, it was unreal, honestly. I never, you know, I remember the first game that I was on the bench and I, and I kind of had that flashback. Like, I was – these guys at one point of my life, you know, 15 years ago, I was in their shoes and it kind of hit me that, you know, just like the circle of life and how it happens. But uh, it was definitely a, um, a great feeling to be a part of a part of something that you would never think that you'll be a part of. And uh, being under Coach Beheim, a Hall of Famer and, and, and Coach Red and Jerry Griff, you know, those guys. You know, so Griff was in my shoes when I was in school. So, uh, you know, we joked about that a lot. Red was a great, a great resource to me. And Jerry, you know, I played for Jerry. Well, I played with Jerry for three years. So, you know, I, I had relationships with all those guys and obviously Coach Behan. Uh, you know, we had, we have a great relationship, you know, a better relationship now than when I was a player for sure. <laughs> you know. Um, tell me a story from last year, either from the bench or a locker room that maybe relates to coaching? One thing about Beheim, and maybe it's not a it's not a funny story or it's not a popular story that people don't want to hear, but one of the things that I noticed when I was coaching or watching him coach is he was always poised. He's never rattled. And he gives his players confidence when things are not going well, whether it's in practice, whether it's we're on a two game losing streak or whether we're down, you know, 15. He always 
he has this skill of keeping guys not too high, not too low, but just keeping guys steady and just focusing on the possession. And that's what I learned as a coach now, now being an assistant coach, you know, I've, you know, I've had some great coaches um, that has coached me. So and he's one of the best. And that's one of the things that I try to take is I try to tell these guys, let's try to win the possession. Let's try to don't worry about the score. Don't worry about if you're up or down, try to win the possession. And that's one of the things that I've learned last year from being around Coach Beheim is that he always keeps his cool and he never lets his players know that if he is rattled, you'll never know. And uh, I think that's a skill and that's why he's been successful for for almost 45 years now. Well, plus 45 years now. You know, that's interesting that you say that because last year, your year as a grad assistant was a, a rare year for mm-hmm. Coach Beheim and Syracuse. It was his first losing season ever. So yeah. that that patient approach or, or or not showing that you're rattled, boy, that, that would have been tested last year. Oh, yeah, for sure. And to be honest with you, I think we overachieved last year. You know, I don't think, you know, a lot of people thought that we were going to win 15 games. I think people thought that we were going to lose, lose more games. So uh, to be able to conquer, you know, to, to, you know, try to battle that storm and get over those humps and get surprising wins on the road. uh, It's, it's just, it's just kudos to him and, you know, what he does and, and, and how he approaches the game. Obviously you never want to be below 500, but it could have been a lot worse. And, you know, we, as coaches, we, you know, we did our best to try to make sure that we were prepared every single time. And, you know, one out of 47 years of having, you know, a rough season is not a bad thing. (laughs) Uh, No, it's not. Absolutely not. Um, You you could have come back this year as a grad assistant, uh, and you know, for for year two at Syracuse. You chose not to. It was last summer or early fall, and you had the opportunity with the, the, the Raptors 905. What about that opportunity uh, was so attractive to you uh, that you were willing to like bypass year two as a grad assistant? Well, me being a grad assistant was such a great opportunity to get in the door of coaching. Uh, you know, getting in the, getting in the door is, is such a tough task, whether you're a player or not. It's a tough task to get into. So when the opportunity came to me um, on a college side, you know, you know, I, I jumped right on it and, and I learned a lot last year, but when I got this opportunity to coach um, in the G League, you know, it was just another step for me to grow as a person, as a coach, as a leader, um, as an assistant coach, and try to learn more and grow and, and, and put myself in a position to be successful in the future. And I think that uh, the time that I did have here at Syracuse, you know, was enough at that moment. And now, like I said, like, like when we were talking off air, I've, I've already have, you know, made leaps and bounds and, and have improved, uh, you know, my coaching skills, my philosophy, you know, my principles, my, you know, what I stand for. And I learned all that in these past two years. So, you know, to answer it in one word, it would just be growth. You know, like I wanted to grow and I want to continue to grow to put myself in position to be successful. What's been the biggest uh, difference or adjustment from going to coaching college players to pros? Um, me personally, just being away from home. I mean, oh, so it's not the not the players, not the ages no. or the money. No, uh, it's you know the players are are similar. You know, this is a young man's game, so these guys are young. You know, whether it's college guys or G League guys, these guys are still still under 25 years old they still you know they still don't know anything about life yet you know so and that's what is 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 important for us as coaches is to you know is to take guys by the hand and put their armor on their shoulders and try to show them the way try to give them the answers to the test and and that was my message 
to our guys uh, yesterday was, you know, we've been having, you know, a rough stretch. You know, we lost a couple of games in a row and um, I had to put on my head coaching hat in the locker room. And I basically, you know, I kind of gave it to him a lot. You know, I, I, you know, like I yelled a lot, very, very loud. But, Did just Nichols yell? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But it was, I was coming into my own. You know, I was, I was, I was growing. That's part of the growth, you know, so. Now, why was that your moment in the locker room instead of the head coach, Eric Corey? Uh, well, here's the answer to that. The, the G League is not just for coaches. I'm sorry. It's not just for players to develop and to get better. It's also a platform for coaches to grow. So I'm, I'm with a great organization where coaches – my head coach allows the other assistant coaches to have a voice, to, to grow, to be in those positions from time to time, not all the time, but, you know, when your name is called, you got to be ready to, you know, to show what you have and show what you can do, how you can influence, how you could encourage. And, you know, and I'm very relatable to the guys because I played in the G league. Now it was called the D league when I played, but, you know, I think I'm relatable in a lot of different ways on and off the basketball court. So, you know, just giving guys the truth, you know, telling these guys the truth and trying to give them the answer to the test, because sometimes as players, we think we're doing stuff that we're really not doing. And as a coach, it's our job to be your ears, to be your extra eyes, to kind of give you an understanding of what's really going on. And, uh, and that was my message in the locker room. And uh, we was actually able to win that game. So we, you know, like we ended our losing game in streak. Uh, not saying that it was because of my speech, but it was, it was a collective group of coaches coming together and making sure that we, that we put everything on the table to make sure that we get a win last night. And I was very, very happy that we was able to do that. And that's why I was able to come home uh, last night. And, you know, now I'm here with my family. I know you have your own voice and your own style and everything, but do you ever catch yourself telling uh, a player something and you and you realize that you're 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 saying something that Coach Bayheim or one of your former assistants told you? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I, like I said, I've I've been coached by multiple Hall of Famers in my career, whether it's in college, in NBA, high school, overseas. I've been very very um, lucky and fortunate to have some great leaders. Um, and I always find myself, you know, I take a piece of all the head coaches that have coached me and I kind of develop my own style and my own philosophy and, uh, you know, what my principles are. And uh, so far, so good. I'm like, I'm always constantly working on my basketball philosophy and what I believe in. And, uh, I think that's the beauty in it. You're always finding something to learn or, you know, to add to, you know, your growth. Okay. Let's do this rapid fire. Really short answers. Not don't have to be one word, but short answers. Short answers. Let's do it. What's the one thing you take from Jim Beheim? Oh, damn. <laughs> one thing I take from Beheim is uh, basketball is life. Jerry McNamara. Great shooter. Red Autry. Great mentor. Alan Griffin. Great mentor. Same thing. Yes, for sure. It, it's interesting that two of the guys at the college level were labeled mentors. Yes. Yes. Uh, he was my GA. You know, he was he was the guy that he was. Uh, Alan Griffin was one of the guys that he used to play me every day. One on one, we used to play every single day and he used to beat me. So, so Mike Hopkins would would tell Griff, you know, he'll call Griff down. He'd be like, "All right, let's play one on one," and he'll beat me one on one every single day. The only time we stopped playing was when I beat him. When I beat him, that's when Hop knew, Alan Griffin knew that I got the message. I, now I now I got the message. Every time you step out on the floor, you have to compete. You have to compete. You have to win. You have to have an edge to you. And sometimes when you're young, you may not understand what coaches are doing or, 
or what they have you do like those tedious boring things you know like layup drills or you know left hand layups or you know working on your pivot foot or playing one on one competing you learn a lot about yourself and a lot about what you can do and what you can bring to the table and that's just you know coaching so that's why i say uh you know alan griffin was you know one of the you know a great influence not not as a colleague when i was a ga but also as a as a uh, young man when i was in college how long did these one on one games against griff go on and and what year were you when you finally got him um it was I think my it was between my freshman and sophomore year, maybe. Freshman and sophomore year, and we would play every day, and he would beat me, convincingly, and I and I and I didn't know why because I was bigger. I probably wasn't yes. stronger stronger than him at the time because you know he was older. You know he you know like his body was already mature. So, but. And I know I can shoot better than him, but he just the mental part of it, you know, and and that's what you know basketball is. It's more mental than anything. If you have the right mentality, you can do whatever you put your mind to. The skill part is easy. You know, you know, everybody has potential. Everybody has talent. But how do you separate yourself from being a mental midget versus being a mental giant? And that's what growth growth allows you to become is, 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 is taking the right steps to be better and playing with the chip on your shoulder being. So for me as a player, I had to be somebody else when I was on the court, I had to be like, I had to turn myself into somebody else when I was on the court, because it's either you, you kill or you get killed, (laughs) you know, and and you were nice. What was I nice? No, no I you were nice. You were nice. You think so? When you were young, when you were too nice, right? You had to get a little mean. Uh, yeah. You know what? I guess so. I mean, maybe, maybe. I mean, so I wouldn't call it nice. I would call it, you know, not knowing. You know, okay. Okay. you only know what you know, right? Okay. So you only know. So like when you go from high school to college, it's a it's a big difference. It's you're going from high school where you're the man and then you go to college where you have 10 other guys that were the man in their high schools. Mm -hmm. So how do you fit in? Right. So how do you, you know, like, it's like you going into an office for the first time, you know, like I'm pretty sure when you, you know, started your job, you didn't go in there. Like, you know, Mike waters, you know, I can, you know, it it was more like, no, I fit, you know, and that's, and I think every college guy, goes through that. Every freshman goes through that. Every rookie that goes in the NBA goes through that. I think every coach who gets into coaching, so last year that was me. It's like, okay, I play the game, but you know, where do I fit in? You know, where, you know, where do I find my piece to the puzzle? And uh, one of the best advice that I've I gotten for all the coaches was be myself. Mm-hmm. And me being myself, you know, allowed me to stand out and just be organic and and you know, whether you like me or not, or whether, you know, as long as you know that this is what I'm going to bring every single day, I'm not going to be off. I'm not going to be on. This is, I'm always going to be on all the time. And this is what you're going to expect from me. And uh, that's what I try to bring, uh, you know, to the guys in the G league also. That's interesting. Uh, We're going to take a pause here real quick to uh, thank our sponsors, uh, our sponsor, Krause Health. Uh, You're listening to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, which is brought to you by Krause Health, providing the latest technology and expertise for the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies. Um, Going back to those one-on-one games, of course, these are orchestrated by Mike Hopkins. No one's surprised by that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to imagine the trash talk that Griff probably hit you with. Or did he keep it quiet because he was working under the, uh, the guidance of Hop? It all depends on the day, <laughs> honestly. Like it all depends on the day, and uh, but you know, some days I would get close to beating them, and then you know that's when you know it's like okay, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, and then eventually I would just beat him convincingly, and you know he served his purpose. <laughs> you know, you know uh, that was his job was 
was to push me and, you know, and, and he did. And even when I was a GA, you know, he allowed me to be myself. He allowed me to step in to, to, to help Jesse, to help uh, the other bigs, like, you know, uh, even coach red, he allowed me to be myself and, and, and coach these guys and, you know, be a piece of the puzzle and just let me, you know, uh, be myself. So very, very appreciative and grateful for that. Well, you had a chance to come back to Syracuse not too re- or fairly recently. Uh, mm-hmm. You were at the Syracuse game against Bryant. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know you know a few of the guys on the team having coached them last year, like Jesse Edwards and Joe Girard and Simeon Torrance, mm-hmm. Benny mm-hmm. Williams. I know. But there's a whole lot of new faces that you didn't get a chance to coach. Yeah. Unless uh, maybe you had a few months with them in the summer. Yeah. I was wondering, just in general, what were your thoughts uh, on the on the team that uh, this uh, at this early stage in the season so what are my thoughts on the team this season thus far um i think we we have we have pieces we have mature pieces we have we have mature and experienced pieces we have pieces who are trying to to learn what they need to learn and we have pieces that are fresh are new who are you know, they're freshmen, you know, they don't really know as much as they would know in the second part of the season or when they become sophomores. You know, I know when I was a freshman, once you hit January, you're not a freshman no more. You know, you've gone through the battle. So I expect those guys who are freshmen to be a little bit better and the guys who who need to be better will be better and the veterans are going to continue to get better. Um, but I think... We have a mixed group uh, that is still learning how how to play with each other. I think we have some good pieces and Jesse Edwards, uh, I think being a foundation defensively, he's doing a good job so far. I think Joe, Joe is coming along, um, you know, being a veteran also. He had a couple of bad games, but uh, he had a really good game last game and uh, him and Jesse kind of led the way. And that's what we expect um, as coaches, as fans. As spectators is, you know, you want your veterans, you know, like the veterans can't have off days. You've got to be on, you've got to be ready to go every single time because your younger guys are looking at you, you know, and coaches are expecting the the best and most of you. Um, Guys like Benny, you know, Benny has to get better. um, And I think he will. I think he's going through that period of still trying to figure himself out. Kind of like what I was saying when I was playing Griff 101 and becoming a mental giant and understanding that he has the capability, the talent to become wherever he wants to be. He just has to believe and take it day by day and get better day by day. And obviously, um, you know, the freshman, you know, Ajuda Mintz is a phenomenal player. He plays, you know, he needs a little, you know, like he has to slow down a little bit, but I think, once the more you play the more you get more comfortable with yourself and how how the speed of the game is i think uh he's 100 100 100 100 100 100 all the time and sometimes you don't have to be 100 all the time sometimes it's 50 sometimes it's 85 sometimes it's 90 you know so but he's going to learn that and you know you got the guys off the bench um that are doing well um chris you have a Justin Taylor who's shooting 40% from the three-point line. He's coming along, averaging six points. But uh, I think this group, you know, like we're going to grow with this group. I think as fans, coaches, you want to grow with this group and you want to, you know, make steps. You know, not, you know, not a, a 20% increase, but a 5% increase every week. You know, 15 20% increase. So now guys get better. Guys are not going to play their best in December. You know, and I think as fans, sometimes we want instant results, but, you know, you want to be playing your best in February, January, March, you know, so, um, but thus far, you know, they're, they're five and four, correct? They are, as we're recording, yes. Five and four, um, obviously the three-point percentage needs to go up a little bit, going from 37% last year to 31% uh, thus far now, but I think, I think 
that will go up once you know, once once uh, Joe starts to hit a little bit more. Benny starts to get going, and like like I said, Justin, you know, is shooting the ball well. And I think he'll probably get some more time. So we'll see what happens. And yeah, obviously, yeah, Joe, yeah. Yeah, Judah Mintz is struggling from three point range. So is Chris Bell early on. Mm-hmm. Have you ever noticed that whenever a freshman is struggling from three point range, Jim Beheim always brings your name up? Does he really? Says, Oh, yeah. Well, Demetrius Nichols, if, if Judah Mintz is shooting 15% from three, D- Coach Bayham will say, well, yeah, remember, Demetrius Nichols, who's one of the best shooters we've ever had, yeah. shot 15% as a freshman. Or if Chris Bell's at 20%, well, then Demetrius Nichols shot 20% as a freshman. You actually shot 23%. Yeah. It was bad. It was bad, man. And it's, and it's, and like I said, it takes, it takes time. It takes, it takes work. You got to put in the work. Mm-hmm. You got to believe in yourself. And you can't cut any corners. You know, you got to be different. You got to have tunnel vision. And that's what I tell the guys now. It's like, you can't let anyone distract you. You can't let anything, every step that you take and make has to be towards your goal. So if you want to become a 40% three-point shooter, you have to train like a 40% three-point shooter. You don't just shoot the shoot. You shoot, you, you train yourself to be as accurate as you can possibly can be. And there's drills that you can do to help you get there. And if you don't get there, you're close enough to get there. So instead of getting 40, maybe you're 38, 39, 37, but it's better than 23, you know, and just, you know, just putting that work in. But I think in due time, you know, those, all those guys, you know, will shoot better um, towards, towards the end of the season. Cause that's where you want to play better at towards the end of the season. Having brought up the fact that you shot 23% from three as a freshman, I have to note that you shot 41% <laughs> as a senior from three. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's still the highest three-point shooting percentage for any Syracuse player with a minimum of 200 attempts. Really? Did not know that. There you Did go. Not that. Did I know that? And, and, you know, it's... High volume, high quality. High volume, high quality, and just, <laughs> just training and believing in yourself. And, you know, playing for... So when you asked me about, you know, one word to describe Beheim is, and I, and I, and I said, you know, you know, he, he, you know, he coaches you, you know, basketball is life, you know? So, you know, the opportunities that he gave me and I wasn't ready for, and I realized it. So he put me on the bench and now it's like, man, so I got an opportunity. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And it's like same thing as like life, you know, like you got to be ready to go and you have to prepare, you have to work, you have to put the time in. So now when you do get your opportunity, you're ready to go. And if you don't do a good job, somebody is behind you that's ready to do it. Somebody is on your right hand side and left hand side. So you got to always have that chip on your shoulder. And I remember and I tell these guys all the time, I lost my starting per. I lost my starting position my junior year for a couple of games. I think I, I think I I think I came off the bench for like three games because I wasn't ready to go, and that has that changed my mentality. It's like you always have to know that when you're out there on the court, you have to put your best foot forward because there's always somebody that's trying to take your spot, and I've. And I've taken that with me as a professional, and that's why I was able to be successful uh, for 13 years playing professional because of that moment of, of never taking anything for granted, staying humble, never getting too high, never getting too low, and just always having something to prove. And that's what I think the good, the great players do is, is, is always, you know, play, play your hardest, play your hardest every single time. Later this season, uh, two of your former teammates are going to have their jerseys honored, Hakeem Warwick and Jerry McNamara. You played with both. You played two seasons with Hakeem. Yeah. I was wondering if there's like a moment anywhere, in either in a game or practice oh, cool. or whatever, for, with Hakeem. Let's start yeah. with Hakeem. Yeah, me and Hack, man, me and Hack go way back, man. He was, you know, he was my vet. Um, I remember when I was when I was a freshman on a bench, I used to watch him. Like, I used to watch him on a bench like, man. This dude is, he's nice. Like, I want to be like, when I become a junior, I want to play like him. That's what I remember saying that on the bench. And I just remember like, I didn't like sitting down on the bench. So 
I used to watch him in practice and how he approached the game and 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 how he he had it goes back to what I was saying before. He always had to be on. Like him as a veteran, as a junior who won a national championship, he didn't have no days off during the game. And and that's the good thing about having good vets early in your career is that you learn, you learn the ropes, you know, like you learn how to be be ready, you learn how to be a professional. And you learn how to grow. Um, so he's been a great influence in my life, in my college years. And even when we were, so as professionals, when he went overseas, you know, he played overseas, um, he played overseas for a couple of years. And I was playing for the number one team in Greece. He was playing for the number two team in Greece. So we, we were guarding each other. And, uh, you know, he'll probably, you know, deny this, but, you know, I was giving it to him. You know, I was I was definitely, you know, showing him, you know, this is not little D Nick anymore. You know, we're both professionals and uh, we actually won and I had a really good game against him. And uh, so those are my stories about Hack, I mean, but, uh, you know, he deserves you know, all the praise and all the honor to get his jersey retired. Um, he's been an influence, you know, to a lot of guys, you know, including myself, a national championship played in the league. You know, just a good, a good clean cut guy, you know, never gets in trouble now. He's coaching for G League uh, Ignite and, uh, you know, he's getting his foot in the door and coaching. So we're actually going to be playing them um, next month, probably in Vegas. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 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 man, he's been a great, a great guy, a great friend to have. And what about Jerry McNamara, the other guy whose jersey is going to be retired later this season? I mean, you played with him for three years, and you you saw him do some incredible things. I was wondering which which Jerry McNamara moment stands out. Man, I mean, there's so many. You know, you got 41 BYU in the NCAA tournament. I remember that. Uh, you got Big East tournament. You know, my sophomore year, Big East tournament. My my junior year, when I flipped. When I had the ball in transition, and then I flipped it back to him for a wide open three. Um, smart move. Yeah, smart move. I mean, there's you know, there's times when I remember, you know, you know, he pushed me. You know, he was, you know, he was. I think he was a junior. No, he was a junior. I was a sophomore, and I think you know, like, but you know, as veterans, if you see something in someone, you want to pull it out of them. And you want to push them to say, hey, you, you can do this. You know, let's, you know, let's go. Like, we need you. And, and I remember one of those conversations that uh, he had with me. Uh, but, you know, when he was a senior and I was a junior, you know, it was kind of our team. You know, like he was the first leading scorer. I was the second leading scorer. So we knew that I had to be on, you know, not just for Coach Beheim. I had to be on for him because I didn't want to let him down his senior year. Um you know, and I had to make sure that I was, you know, I was always prepared and, and uh, you know, we battled together. You know, we, you know, we've, we've talked, you know, we cried together when we lost, you know, we've, you know, we've done a lot of, a lot of things together, you know, as, as, as teammates. And, um, you know, I'm just honored to be a part of, a part of their legacy, you know, to be able to be playing with them or have played with them. And now, you know, 15, 20 years later, you know, Jerry's coaching um, at his alma mater and they're, and these two guys are both getting their jersey retired. I mean, I wish I could be there um, to celebrate with them, but uh, they both deserve it. And um, it's just, you know, I'm just happy to be in the room with them. Well, it's always fun to be in the same room with Demetrius Nichols. I got to tell you, um, you're you're a pleasure. Uh, you're a wonderful guy. Um, always fun to talk to, and an inspiration as well. We didn't even have to touch on it this time, but for those out there who don't know, who have never read Demetrius's story, uh, when I say he's an inspiration, he overcame a really uh, severe childhood stutter. Mm -hmm. One that you actually you know had into adulthood in in your your playing careers at Syracuse. Uh, you, uh, you, we wrote a story about it and did a short video about it uh, uh, roughly a year ago, how you overcame that stutter. I got to mm -hmm. tell you, um, we're probably telling some people about it now and they just listened to you for half an hour and they would have no idea yeah. what you went through as a young kid. Oh man. It's, you know, it was, it was a rough, rough couple of what? 
27 years, maybe a rough couple of 27 years. <laughs> A rough, a rough couple of 27 years. And, you know, I remember, I remember, do, do you remember the game when, I don't know, I'm not sure if I was a junior or a senior. We were playing Wichita State at home. I remember that game. And I got a steal. We were, I think we were down by one. And I had an opportunity to, so I, so I dribbled the ball up. I missed the layup because, you know why? I didn't use the backboard. I should have used the backboard. But, and I tell this story all the time. I remember it was like 30,000, you know, students there, well, fans there. And it was the second half. So when I'm dribbling, all I can see is orange because everybody had on an orange shirt, you know, orange, you know, billboard, whatever the case may be. And the rim is orange. So I wasn't dribbling with my head up. I was dribbling with my head down because I didn't want to mess up. Cause I know Coach Beheim was on the sideline looking at me like, don't mess up. And once I got to the rim, I was too close to the rim. And I think it hit the back of, of the rim and it popped out. And we ended up losing that game. And I remember um, you asking me, like, do you want to talk? And I was like, I have to face the music. I have to face the music. And, you know, obviously, like I said, like, you know, I struggled with my stuttering, but I wasn't, I stopped being afraid. I stopped being afraid of making mistakes. I stopped being, I stopped being afraid of that shadow. And having a stutter for that long, you're always, you're always trying to avoid conversation. You're trying to avoid people from talking whatever the case may be. And once I stopped being afraid, once I started attacking my fears, good things started to happen. Uh, not just off the court, but on the court. So the same mentality that I had off the court with my stuttering is the same mentality that, that I took with on the court. It was, I'm gonna attack my, I'm gonna attack my fears and I'm gonna live with those results. And I remember one of the things that I used to do when I was going through speech therapy, the therapist would say, you have to call somebody and say, my name is Demetrius Nichols. I have a startup but I'm working on it. And at first I was like, what are you, what is this? This sounds crazy. This sounds, like, it's kind of embarrassing actually. But what it does is it just, it clears the elephant out the room. So now I don't have to worry about, because now you already know that I have a stutter. So if I do slip up from time to time, I'm not like, how is this person looking at me? Because you already know what I, you know, what I do. So, but um, it took me a while to overcome it. Um, you know, overall, I think in college, my junior and senior year, I got better, but it actually came back a couple of years after I left college. And then once it came back, I'm like, okay, I really got to, I really have to solve this, you know, I, you know, like I really have to conquer this fear and I really have to conquer this, you know, disability, you know, some people call it a disability, some people don't, but I really have to conquer this disability and, you know, be a, be an influence, um, be an inspiration, not just for myself, but for my children and for the people around me. So, um, you know, I just really put the time in. I really, you know, you know, look myself in the mirror and say, every day I have a choice to make. Every day I have a choice to, to attack my fear, to speak with confidence and to prepare with confidence. Um, and so far, so good. So far, so good. Um, not everybody, you know, I have a lot of people in my family that started, that still started to this day. So, um, and I think I'm one of, you know, one in a million, but I know there's other people out there that, that struggle with stuttering or have their own disabilities. And I know that if I can do it, anybody can do it. And, uh, and, and I want to be that inspiration. I want to be that, uh, that, that motivation for people who, who do struggle, you know, in life with whether that's, in, whether that's confidence, whether that's having a disability, you know, I know that, uh, there's people out there that need help and, you know, I would love to, you know, help people. So uh, I'm just happy to be here. Well, it, it's a wonderful story. And the amazing part is you get to tell it so eloquently. Mm -hmm. um, you are an inspiration. 
And you're also just a great guy. And I'm so glad you were able to take a little time with us and, and join me here on the podcast. And so we could uh, hear from you and catch up a little bit. And good luck to you for the rest of the season up there in Toronto. Uh, but we will be keeping an eye out for you at the Dome in case you pop in to, to watch Syracuse anytime this year. I appreciate it. And like whenever I am in town, you know, I'll always you know be at the game. And uh, it's always a pleasure, you know, talking to you. I've known you for a very, very long time. And I really appreciate, you know, the time and effort that, you know, you uh, you do to reach out to me and always stay connected. So uh, you always be my guy. Well, guys like you make my job easy. So I really appreciate it. Um, for Demetrius Nichols uh, here on the Inside Syracuse Basketball pro- Podcast, brought to you by Krause Health, um, I'm Mike Waters. We look forward to seeing you again here another time. Thank you. And thanks, Demetrius. Go Cues. Brought to you by Kraus Health, the official partner of Syracuse Athletics, providing the latest technology and expertise in the treatment of stroke and cardiac emergencies.